All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're gonna finish up our topic of metals, division five, with this uh, third part in the series. And what we're gonna be talking about in this lecture is cold formed metal framing, uh, aluminum, metal finishes, and other metals. So this corresponds to sections 5.2 and 5.9 to 5.11 in the textbook for those who are reading along. Before we start this last topic, uh, there's just a couple final notes uh, on structural steel. And if we were to look at the project manual, here's what we see are some notes on uh, delivery, delivery, storage, and handling of our structural steel. You see, protect steel members uh, and package materials from erosion and deterioration. So uh, that should make sense. We've talked before about how metal, in essence, has iron in it, and the iron, when exposed to the elements, will start to rust. So we need to protect that from happening. And along that same sense, it says, do not store materials uh, on structure in a manner that might cause distortion or damage to members or supporting structures. So uh, just how you store it is, is definitely important because it is very, it can be very heavy structural members. And not only can they deform the structures that they're leaning against or on, but they can actually uh, deform themselves. For instance, if I were to look at an I-beam, an I-beam is strong this way. So if I were to store an I-beam this way, it would be fine. But if I were to turn it over on its side, and, and in essence, see if I can draw this, I would see like something like that. If I were to store my I-beams like this, they're not strong in that other direction, so we could actually end up deforming and having a slight sag to our I-beam ray. So that's some of what they're talking about, as well as just the overall weight. Uh, of course, fall protection is required. Anytime you're working on a high structure, you can see this gentleman up here fully suited up. Uh, also, we want to talk a little bit about fireproofing. We talked about how... Uh, steel can have very negative consequences if there is a fire because it, its coefficient of thermal expansion is so high that it would want to deform and, and tear everything apart on the building. How do we provide this fire resistance to our steel material? Well, we can, in essence, encase it or, or put a casing all the way around it, right? And that can be out of uh, concrete or masonry. Of course, if you have uh, a column in the middle of your concrete, that's going to add a lot of weight, a lot of dead weight. I could use plaster, uh, a little more labor intensive, but not quite as heavy, uh, and it could be used in these exterior humid applications. I could put drywall around it, probably the most common, right? Uh, and then it just could finish it just like a normal wall. I could have a spray on fireproofing. Maybe you've seen this before in buildings. If you look up to the exposed structures, you can usually see it's almost like a thicker texture type to it. Uh, on a side note, I was working on a movie theater and they had sprayed on the fireproofing too thick. And what happened, I think this was the AMC in uh, Westminster, um, off of Highway 36 there. And what happened is the fireproofing was so heavy, it's self-weight, it would start peeling off when the sound from the movie was so loud and it would fall on people. So we had fireproofing falling on people. So my part in that job was providing a rolling scaffold so that they could uh, scrape off the fireproofing and redo it. So I guess too much of a good thing. Uh, careful of that. That was spray on fireproofing. Uh, combinations, you could have a spray on and then have, uh, have it around drywall or something like that. Also mastics and paints. So uh, as far as building codes without fire protection, uh, building heights and areas are limited and with fire protection we can go, it isn't affected by it. And here you can see in these drawing notes, uh, we actually saw this slide before, this picture before in a different slide when we were talking about uh, structural framing. Now we're saying beams shall be fabricated that in such a way that after erection, uh, any camber due to rolling or shop fabrication is upward. So the idea behind that is if I have an I-beam and there is a camber, then of course this is totally exaggerated, right? And I have some columns down here. Once I get my load on there, my floor load and everything else, then it will be uh, back to a level surface. So that's why you want to put the camber upward as opposed to down, which would just have a negative effect once we add that extra weight. Uh, refer to the architectural drawings for the extent of fireproofing like we just talked about. All right, so now we can move on to this new topic of cold formed light metal framing. 
and you've probably seen this uh, definitely more common in commercial construction at this point but sometimes you'll see it in residential where instead of like when we, when we have the stick framing with all the two buys coming up uh, what we have is this is this metal framing these metal studs and and metal beams and metal columns and everything else right so we call this cold formed steel framing because if you remember when we're forming our steel normally we're heating it up and we're extruding it or we have some other process of forming it and this is not heating at all this is this is taking the raw material so it's usually a very thin sheet rolled type thing where i can frame it to whatever i need a very light gauge meaning thin metal uh, this provides a non-flammable dimensionally stable structural system for light loads you wouldn't use it for heavy structural loads because it is such a thin gauge uh, and we can use it just like we would wood framing for walls floors roofs and partitions so here's another picture another example uh, most common we have these things called c members in channels and you can you can somewhat see from this picture that this is a c shape i have another picture coming up here uh, and we're assembling these by either screwing them together or we are welding them so here we see what i meant by a c member so it looks like a c versus a channel like this one right c members have this half an inch right here this little half an inch lip on the top and bottom while the channels do not they're just a straight you know u shape uh, they're often punched to allow for pipes and wiring. These are these punches that we see here, so I can easily thread my wire or whatever else I need through there. Uh, I also have track components, or it's also called a runner. So this is that piece down at the bottom that is slightly wider so that those joists will fit or those studs will fit inside. So for our gauges, our thickness of the metal, it's very thin thin gauge it says here 20 to 12 to 20 and yeah you get a little comparison over here to what that thickness might mean uh, the yield strength of this material uh, is typically 33,000 psi 33 ksi however grade 50 which is 50 ksi is also available and uh, they can have a standard galvanized coating to make them weather resistant right you can see that uh, terminology is the same we've seen for like these other members like I-beams and things where we have a web uh, and the top and bottom are the flanges and this one of course has the little lip on there as well. So here's some connections. We can see we have our channel here and then I have, it looks like a C member inside of it. Uh, there's that runner again and then I can see that I would screw right through the side of that runner to attach the whole thing to the, to the stud. Uh, I can see I can build a box out of them or I can connect them with some uh, a clip angle where it attaches to both pieces. Uh, and this would be like a floor joist and then we have a girder or a header joist over here on the end. As far as the structural design of these members, it's not always specified by the engineer. Uh, and we talk about structural design, we're talking about the loads, uh, how much load we can apply, the deflections, that uh, it's all based on the spacing, etc. The reason it isn't always specified by the engineer is because it's often defined by the manufacturing process. So the manufacturer is the one who is, who is responsible for providing much of that information. So it's different than like structural steel where it's nationally defined on what steel members. And I think I had a link to the AISC uh, database of structural steel, steel shapes where now it might be from the particular manufacturer. So for example, Clark and Diedrich, here's a link to their uh, specifications for floor joists. And you see some of the same framing stuff we just talked about and what they say you need for their framing and web stiffeners and things like that. But more importantly, what they're providing are these span tables. So if we were to look at one of these span tables, so you can see we have 10 pounds per square foot dead load and 20 pounds per square foot live load. Total load deflection, L over 240. The total length, the span divided by 240. So it seems like that must be governing in these cases as opposed to it actually breaking. Uh, and then you can look at the live load deflection of L over 480 or the live load deflection of L over 360, depending on whatever you, your particular uh, probably project manual calls for. Then you can look at different yield strengths, 33 or 50. I uh, look to see if it's single span or two span, and then you can get finally what your overall span can be 
for these members, right? But the point is, uh, I don't expect you to know how to really read these tables per se, but what I'd no what, want you to know is that instead of the engineer specifying the spans, uh, you'd probably be looking it up in a table or someone's looking up in a table. Or it could be uh, specified in the construction documents. So it could be that the engineer is doing it, it could be that the manufacturer, but regardless, it should be in the construction documents, right? Um, so, and this is an example from the computer science building. And what I do see is that, that we need to submit some shop drawings for all these prefab panels uh, and these punched metal studs or joists. Indicate all member sizes, spacing and locations, blah, 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 right? Now this one does say submittals for all metal stud system defined on the structural drawings. What that tells me is in this case, it was actually laid out by a structural engineer. My guess is the structural engineer went to the manufacturing company, found those same tables, and then uh, did it from there, right? So a little bit more uh, on the framing, on the products, uh, type, size, gauge, spacing, fasteners, and the drawings are required by these specifications. So it talks more about those framing members. Uh, this talks about the, the yield point is either 33 uh, 1,000 PSI or 50,000 PSI, like we said, so it's either 16 gauge or 18 gauge, uh, based on the thickness of the gauge, what yield strength we need, something like that. And as part of the erection uh, of the cold formed metal framing, uh, we're conforming to ASTM C1007 uh, and the manufacturer's instructions. So once again, these are very manufacturer dependent. So here's a computer science building again, and I can see some examples of this metal framing. I think there's, yeah, there's a better slide here where I can see some of this framing going on throughout, both on this exterior, and it looks like they have the same thing on the interior of the building. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about aluminum. So where do we see aluminum in construction? It's, uh, it's in quite a few places. We can see it in windows and door frames, similar to this one here. We can see it on roofs. There's a, uh, an aluminum roof right here, right? Uh, we can see it used as siding. And actually, aluminum siding uh, kind of got a bad rap recently, so you don't see as much aluminum siding. Uh, heating systems, staircases, uh, power lines. It used to be that residential construction consisted mainly of aluminum electric wires, but uh, uh, copper has taken over in that sense. High rises. So a lot of high rises uh, are built out of aluminum because it's a much lighter material and they can go higher without having that massive weight, self-building weight pulling down on it. This is one that uh, I'm intimately familiar with, shoring, eye joist, and stringers. So this is an example of shoring. So, sh so shoring is the process of holding up this concrete while it cures and um, what we have are these are our joists that are supporting this system and those are made out of aluminum um, if you look close uh, right up in there there's this it's actually a wood block it's a nailer block so that i can nail my plywood or whatever i'm using for a forming face uh, right to those aluminum joists. The reason we like the aluminum joists, and these are what we're calling aluminum stringers, these beams that are supporting them, and these temporary structures. The reason we like those is because they're really light. Like this 10 foot member would probably only weigh about 30 pounds. So, uh, versus if you did it with steel to get the same strength, it'd be much, much heavier, and your labor costs are drastically increased. So something like this, uh, the man labor uh, expense is much lower. So what is aluminum? What's it made from, right? Uh, it's a component of the Earth's crust found in raw bauxite ore, and it's crushed and purified, mixed with sodash, lime, and water. And then what that does is it creates this aluminum hydrate. Uh, we heat the aluminum hydrate, and it creates this uh, aluminum oxide. And then that aluminum oxide is electrolyzed to make metallic aluminum. Um, you can see some of the steps in the process over here. So remember what an alloy is. An alloy is mixing our pure metals together. And with aluminum, I can alloy it, mix it with copper, manganese, silicone, magnesium, or zinc. Uh, because if I look at just pure aluminum, 
it's actually it's a very soft and not very strong metal its tensile strength is only about 7,000 psi where steel remember we we're talking about like 50,000 psi so much much less uh, so it's very soft and ductile so it's very flexible so uh, we can create a heat treated alloy to make it uh, stronger and stiffer so the strength increased by alloying if we're going to do the heat treatable then we're going to add copper, magnesium, zinc, and silicone. Uh, and this is what it means by it can be strengthened with heat treatments. And, and what heat treatment, I don't, I don't know if I remember covering this or not, but what heat treatment is, if I heat up the metal, um, I'm in essence changing the fundamental properties and then I quench it, meaning I, I cool it off quickly, it freezes it into place, making it a stronger material. Uh, and then non-heat treatable alloys, I can, I can uh, make alloys with aluminum and combine it with manganese, silicone, iron, and magnesium. Uh, these cannot be strengthened with the heat treatment. I'm wondering about this magnesium because magnesium is here and here, but we'll just ignore that for now. But it can be strengthened by strain hardening, cold rolling, and other mechanical hardening. And that basically means if you, if you form the material in a certain way, you can change the mechanical properties. So uh, like we said earlier, pure aluminum has this tensile strength of 7,000 PSI, and I can alloy it with these other materials and give it the heat treatment, and that'll totally increase its tensile strength. And it says here you get up to 100,000 PSI. It's naturally corrosion resistant because there is no iron in there, so it doesn't react with, with moisture the way steel does. However, it is susceptible to chemical attacks, so you do want to put some sort of coating on there to protect it, like a bituminous paint. As far as the sustainability, uh, there is a, a very robust recycling program that, that actually works. In fact, this was one of those disadvantages for us using those aluminum stringers and, and joists on our construction sites is because the aluminum would walk away from us. Uh, people would break into our sites, steal the aluminum because they could recycle them because there was so much money given back. Same thing with copper, right? However, some disadvantages to the aluminum. Electricity is one third of the production cost of primary aluminum. So it takes a lot more electricity and energy use is like seven times that of steel. So much more energy. It's a high conductor of heat, so during this, this process, you need some sort of thermal break. If I'm comparing aluminum to steel, aluminum is naturally corrosion resistant, where steel will, will oxidize and rust, right? Aluminum is extremely lightweight. Uh, like we said, that's why it was good for the man labor part, versus steel is much heavier and denser. Aluminum is a high electrical conductivity. Like we said, we use it for those long distance power lines versus steel. Well, it doesn't really conduct electricity like that anyways. Uh, but aluminum has seven times the energy use of steel during production. For, for steel, it is harder, less likely to form, and stronger than aluminum. So depending on your application. Other metals and applications, uh, we have copper. So we see copper in the construction industry on places like roofs with these copper roofs. Very expensive, especially more over the last 10, 15 years. Gutters and downspouts. And now notice the color difference. Here we have what you consider to be that shiny copper color. And then we have this green color. So what's happening is this, this copper is oxidizing. And uh, in essence, uh, you'll end up with this. And some people really like this, this uh, greenish color, right? I want to say the Statue of Liberty is this, the same thing. Uh, uh, we also use it in... Flashing, uh, cladding, pipes. Here's some water pipes made out of copper. Um, nowadays, it seems like we're going more to PEX, but, uh, but if you ever worked with these copper plumbing and you solder your pipes, it's good fun. Also, electric cables, so a good conductor of electricity. So here, we have, it's the second most used metal after iron and its alloys, like steel. Uh, it's uh, mined and roasted and smelted and refined. Uh, it's soft and malleable and ductile and strong and a good electricity conductor, like we said. Does not corrode in dry air, but will oxidize and has many uses, like we said before. And, and here's, uh, here's some other ones that we can alloy it with uh, to make brass. We can alloy it with zinc to make brass or we can alloy it with tin to make bronze. Some other metals we should be familiar with are zinc. 
Um, and when it says the behavior properties are like plastic, plastic means it's, it's very malleable. You move it around, bend it, but not break it. High corrosion resistance. We use this for like coatings for galvanizing iron and steel and alloying other metals. Uh, lead is also very ductile, soft, weak, dense, uh, also has a high corrosion resistance and we use it for pipes well not so much drinking pipes anymore but used to use lead pipes and they found out there was this lead poisoning issue uh, radiation protection roofing uh, chromium is very hard high corrosion resistance and we use it as an alloying metal with mainly with iron to create stainless steel uh, we have nickel is very ductile uh, high corrosion resistance and we can uh, alloy it with steel as well we have tin and moderate corrosion resistance a little lower still ductile and soft and we can alloy it with copper to make bronze so metals also can have finishes to them uh, we can have mechanical finishes where we can grind it or polish or sandblast it uh, next time you're at Denver International Airport there was a big deal when they put up all of the uh, panels throughout. They're, I believe they're aluminum panels, but they're panels like in the elevators and on a lot of the walls. And if you look, there's a, there's a finish on there where it looks like they took like an angle grinder or something and just started marking it up all the way throughout. Uh, and that was all, to my knowledge, done by hand. You can have chemical finishes like for cleaning, conditioning, coatings, decorative finishes, oxidation removal. You can have organic or inorganic, as we see some examples over here. Uh, basically, the difference between those are carbon-based, if we have organic, or non-carbon-based, if we have inorganic. Uh, sustainability issues with metals. Some disadvantages is that we do get some airborne pollutants when we're finishing our metals. Some advantages, you can have finishes such as like uh, powder coating, which have no airborne pollutants. And if you've ever powder coated, you know you send a current through your material and that creates a charge and then you sh you shoot this powder into the air and it's attracted because it's the opposite charge and once the powder it, it in essence sticks to the object then you can heat it up and then the powder melts basically and creates this coating on your object and the the other i don't know if these are advantages more like mitigations but uh you can you can uh, use a brush or sprayed finishes in a factory and you can capture these, right, and contain them. So at least it doesn't get out and about and harm as many. So uh, a little bit on finishes from the project manual. We have galvanizing. We said that's a way to keep corrosion from happening. Uh, hot dip galvanized items indicated with standard list and below. And we have our ASTM standards for steel and iron products because those are the ones that will have rusting issues. For stainless steel finishes, we need to grind and polish the uniform directionally textured polished finish indicated free of cross scratches run grain with long direction to each piece. So basically just what we what we want the final product to actually look like. So that's what I have for this presentation. Uh, as usual, I hope you found that informative and we'll see you all next time. Thanks.